My name is Ekaterina Arshavskaya. I work in the ELA program, and I mostly work with <laughs> ELA students, of course, but I'm also a coordinator for the International TA Workshop, and I work with students in the MSLT program. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim Andrus. Uh, I'm also uh, at uh, the ELE program, and I've been interested in uh, teaching with technology for uh, ever since I've been a teacher in the late 90s. Uh, I'm glad to be here and uh, share some things that I do with you. Hello, my name is Marta Hawaczkiewicz. I'm a senior lecturer at um, ELE, and I love teaching with technology so much that I am currently pursuing my PhD in Instructional Technology and Learning Sciences. Hi, my name is Tyra Nieves, and I'm also a lecturer for ELE. And I started using technology about five years ago when I got hired as a lecturer for ELE. And uh, I think it's great because it's something that all our students are kind of obsessed with. So why not use it for their education and not just other forms of communication? Jumping real fast, I forgot one thing. Thank you. So for those who are participating uh, at a distance, if you want to submit questions for the presenters, you can email me directly at travis.thurston at usu.edu, or you can submit a question on either our Twitter or Facebook account. Great. Uh, I just wanted to give you a heads up that at, uh, a little bit later on we are going to be using uh, devices. So if you have an internet connected device, a cell phone or a laptop that's on the Wi-Fi, um, be prepared. We're going to uh, jump onto this. So. Okay, so my part will be about digital resources and how I use them with my students. Okay, let's see. Yeah, okay, so um, a little theory, right, to start with. Um, the pedagogy of multiliteracies, I'm sure most of you heard about this. So the idea is today when we, talk, when we think about literacy, it's not only the ability to read and write, right? It's a lot about using the uh, computer, right? Doing things online, creating websites, working with videos, uh, working with images, right? All kinds of things. And uh, another interesting uh, comparison, maybe you also heard about it, that we can think of our students as digital natives. So they are born into all kinds of technology, right? And oftentimes we, professors, teachers, are digital immigrants, right? So we have to catch up with our students in all kinds of ways, right, with technology. Um, okay, so the digital um, resources, I think one of, the, uh, one of the forms is the images, right? And especially the images with um, like works of art, right? You can see here some examples. So what I, what I did in my speaking, listening, and presentations class, I, I'm a language teacher. Um, so that, that's an exercise with slow looking, okay? So when they see an image, they first, yeah, they see and they describe it. Right? Uh, then that's the first step, okay? The second step is think, right? So think what it may mean. So what is the, uh, uh, the artist's message? Uh, what kind of story he's, he or she is trying to tell? Or can you infer meaning? Can you construct meaning from the picture, right? And the uh, third stage is wonder or ask questions. So um, after you see the picture, after you discuss it, right? And we do it collaborative, so they share all those things. Um, what kind of questions does it raise? What, what are you curious about? What else you want to know about the artist or about the work of art? And, um, and this, we also wrote an article, a short pedagogical article about this, if you're interested, with my colleague. Um, you see the reference there. Uh, so with these images, right, so maybe the first reaction is it's just uh, kind of like toys, right? It's a balloon dog, it's the Play-Doh, right? And then when you think about it, uh, it maybe has some association with your childhood, right? 
Uh, but imagine students coming from different cultures, right? It may not have uh, the same kind of meanings for them, right? It may seem Western thing, right? The Western thing. Or it may be the same because there is a lot of um, globalization, right? Due to the globalized nature of society. So you may, you, they may see the same thing, right? So it would be interesting to see what they, uh, what they see, right? And then the last thing <laughs> is, um, so what do you think they're trying to say? Are they trying to comment on our society? What kind of things we appreciate? Something new and shiny, right? But what happens to things that get old? Yeah, so there's also and consumerism, right? So there is also some commentary on the society. And they, again, they may have different answers to this. And um, so I, I work with international students. And uh, one of the, again, exercises kind of building on that is asking them to see different things from their cultural lens, right? So I, I, I think most of you would be familiar, again, with the idea of funds of knowledge. So students come to our classes with um, different cultural backgrounds, right? And they bring a lot of knowledge, uh, cultural knowledge uh, to our classes, so how we can use it, right? And that's one of the ways. Um, so the next stage, uh, in, in this kind of activity is, um, so in my presentation class, I ask students to go, that's um, like a real new museum, right? That's not an online, the NEMA, the USU Art Museum, and they see different works of art uh, through their culture. So maybe m colors have different meanings, right, in different cultures. So you can see the same thing, but you may have different associations, right? Or even objects, they have different associations from, for people on different cultures, okay? So that's their project. They have to describe something at the museum, seeing through their culture perspe perspective. Uh, then uh, we video record their presentations, and um, that's also a final project in their uh, speaking class. So they practice, they get feedback, and then we will, this is in progress, we will also post these videos, these presentations online on the, uh, on the NEMA website. So it crea creates an online collection of model student presentations, right? So it's something that can be used in, as a model for future students. And also uh, uh, for the students, it makes their learning more authentic and more real, right? So now they don't only present for their classmates or for their teacher, but uh, it's gonna be online, right? So it makes it more like high stakes, right? So it makes it more authentic. Um, and then other, uh, kind of similar things you can do. There is a Metropolitan Museum of, Museum of Art. I think it has um, a great um, website, web page. There are a lot of different things you can do and there are some educational resources there. Like they have interviews with artists. Uh, so that can work for listening class. And then Google Art and Culture, they have a collection um, of different works of art. And they also have educational quizzes and they have it in uh, several languages, right? So if you teach it in a different language, this can work well. And again, if it may be totally like different from you, maybe you teach biology or history, I'm sure other museums ha may have great websites that you can use um, in your classroom. And then, um, so that was visual arts, right? So what happens with visual arts? So now let's see an example with performing arts. And I wanna play, um, a short video before kind of to change things and it has some strong language so <laughs> I hope that would be okay <laughs> with you. Yeah, you can play. Just in from 50. Oh, oh oops. that went back. Uh -huh. So maybe 50, 53 maybe from there. Yeah, that's uh, uh -huh. Anything you need to know, I'll be playing uh, Vice President Aaron Burr uh, and snap along if you like. How does a bastard orphan son of a whore and a Scotsman dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence impoverished and squalor grow up to be a hero and a scholar the ten dollar founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder by being a lot smarter by being a self-starter by 14 they you placed him in charge of the trade and charter and every day more slaves were being slaughtered or carted away across the the waves are Hamilton kept it. Okay, so it gives you the idea, right? Kind of some 
flavor <laughs> and taste. Um, so what I do, uh, in, again, in my speaking class, uh, we work on pronunciation, right? And you can feel, uh, you can feel the rhythm, right? Uh, so it's a, a rap kind of music, and I think many students can relate to that. Uh, so what I do is we have the lyrics for the song, and then um, as they listen, they can mark the intonation, right? The voice goes up and down. They can also work with the rhythm, right? So which words or syllables are, uh, syllables are stressed or non-stressed? And um, another uh, uh, idea how to use uh, Hamilton, right, the musical, I also uh, use it in the writing class, right? So uh, often when you talk about plagiarism and referencing the works of others, I think for international students it maybe uh, may look uh, overwhel overwhelming, right? It's maybe a new concept for some of them. But then um, you can illustrate it. Uh, it's actually a simple idea, right? So whenever you want to do something good, you want, you want to know what was done before, right? You know, want to know uh, what people wrote before, created before in that line. Uh, so the same with this uh, musical, right? So if you listen to a few songs, you may recognize a familiar hip-hop hip -hop songs or rap songs, and actually they reference other, the works of others on their album, right? So it, it happens in music, it happens in other fields, and so why don't we reference, right, the works of others in writing? And um, yeah, that's my final thing uh, with this musical, right? So it's uh, culturally rich. There is a lot of topics and thing themes uh, that yeah, that come up there. So other topics you can discuss is diversity and privilege and you ask history, right? Uh, so I assign my students research um, presentations about history based on this um, musical and then also raising questions of diversity. So you know they cast um, uh, Hispanic, uh, Asian, uh, even women as founding fathers. So I ask my students, do you think it's a good idea? Why they do this? And is it possible uh, in their country? Okay. And uh, another song I use is nonstop, uh, but there are a few other songs that may work for your classes. And there is also a great article by Deborah Johnson, who is our colleague in the journalism department. So she has a lot of activities um, if you want to look it up more. And now Marta and Kim will continue with online response tools. Connect to uh, pollev.com slash USU. You can, you can see that address up at the top of the screen. And please answer the question. I knew someone was going to put sleepy or, you know. Uh, uh. Okay. Well, all right, great. Uh, so what we're doing right now is a, a real-time response. And this is uh, uh, the next part of our, our presentation, introducing you to how we can uh, poll or get um, you know live reactions from a class or an audience, and uh, as you can see it's kind of fun. Okay, I'll turn the time over to Marta. Real-time response systems, they go by many names. Uh, they could be audience response system, classroom response systems. You'll see them called very uh, great variety of things. Um, now, if you remember clickers, if you taught or went to school within the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years, 
Um, clickers were devices installed in class where students could respond to a teacher's uh, question. And um, now they have pretty much became obsolete because uh, those uh, mobile, uh, the response systems have gone mobile. And that makes them very, very uh, convenient because um, all students come to class equipped with a laptop um, or a um, tablet or, or smartphone. And this way, instead of a clicker, they can use their own device to participate in the class. Um, those uh, different systems are also very flexible. They uh, have many uses, so teachers can use them to um, for assessment purposes, for diagnostics, for um, to engage students in reflective, reflection, um, and many other ways. They also are flexible in a way that teachers can do or create many tasks. So uh, they can create uh, polls, they can create trend false questions to which students can answer, multiple choice, uh, open-ended, and you name it, you got it. Um, now, there are many positive effects that uh, have been reported by research, um, and they include um, increased engagement of students and participation. Also, uh, students have been known to attend better. Um, that also, um, there is some research that says that it's, if students engage with material, either watch, watch um, a lecture or a video or read something and then answer uh, comprehension questions or um, quick questions right after, they retain this knowledge uh, better later for longer. So there's a lot of good things that could happen uh, in a classroom. Um, when used appropriately, I should say. But um, the, the first um, real-time response system we'll tell you about is going to be Poll Everywhere. Yes, and Kim will tell you all about it. I don't know which one you want first. This microphone handoff is fun. All right, so uh, Poll Everywhere. Uh, this is one I've been using for, I think, about five years now. And that's the one we did uh, a little bit earlier when you told uh, us how you were feeling. Uh, so um, there are, again, a variety of platforms, but this is my favorite one. And uh, so I'll be demonstrating some of the kinds of questions that I ask and some of what um, the response types and the summary displays will look like. Uh, but first of all, the question is, you know, how much does it cost? Uh, well, this is a free uh, service. Of course, they have their you know, uh, paid uh, levels. Um, I think for a student account, it's 13 or 14 per semester. Teacher accounts are much higher, 350 per semester. But fortunately, uh, the basic um, uh, functionality is totally free. And so uh, as long as your questions aren't uh, getting more than 40 responses, uh, uh, you should be good. If you have more than 40 students in a class, you may have to, to upgrade or ask the university to check into a university uh, level account. <laughs> All right, so uh, again with Poll Everywhere, uh, as opposed to the um, you know, old school clickers, um, you can get a, a, a much uh, larger variety of types of responses. So in addition to the you know, true or false, A, B, or C uh, responses, you can ask students to submit text as you all did with your uh, how are you today uh, responses. Uh, you can have students uh, upvote or downvote uh, other text entries. Uh, you can present images and have students click on the image to identify different parts of the image. And uh, as students are doing this, uh, your classroom dis display, display screen, your monitor or your projector, uh, will be showing these uh, responses in real time if you want them to. Uh, you can also hide the responses while you're waiting for everyone to give their feedback so they're not being influenced by what other students are posting to the screen. <laughs> All right, so here are a few examples of uh, ways that I've uh, been using Poll Everywhere. I looked on my account and I think I have like 75 or 80 uh, polls still that I haven't deleted yet, so I've, I've used it a lot in most of my uh, English uh, language learner classes. So uh, on the left side, we have 
and icebreaker activity. Right? I have students on the first day write some sentences about themselves, and then I'll have them just briefly introduce themselves to the class, and then we connect the sentence to the student. And that's a fun way to handle icebreakers. Um, this is an open-ended style of, of question, so uh, students can write, um, again, sentences or words. Um, they do have to enter a name, and I think that most of you, when you were logging on and, and uh, before you entered your, your answer to how are you, you had to enter a name. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, you say? Okay. But right. could skip it. It did give you an option. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I think that helps uh, for a little bit of responsibility so you don't get wild and crazy responses by people who want to derail your class or whatever. I can say I'm Romney. <laughs> yes, yes, you can. And so if, if you're concerned about that, uh, you could say you're Mitt Romney, yeah. And if you're concerned about that, um, you can go ahead and you know, think about getting the, uh, the accounts there. Um, with the free version, you can't do too much about it. And also, if you want to moderate responses, you have to get the, the paid version. So some disadvantages to the free version, but, but I rarely have any kind of issues uh, with that. So. Uh, all right, uh, on the right side, uh, here we can see the uh, Q&A where I'll have students um, post a response and then uh, I'll tell them you can upvote and downvote you know, once each or something so that they're responding to other people's responses as well. Uh, in this case, uh, this was a topics class where we read a, a health article and um, I wanted them to kind of go beyond that and, and, and think about what, uh, out of all the health issues that were described, what was the biggest health threat? And so um, they posted their own opinions about the, the, the health threat and then did some up and down voting. Now, you can see that diabetes is listed three times. <laughs> it's because I think uh, three students entered it about the same time. So uh, uh, that's how it worked. Super fat, didn't get a lot of votes. <laughs> uh, all right, a few other examples. Um, here's another open-ended uh, style of question. And uh, in this case, I was, uh, teaching a reading class, and I had students um, assigned to uh, write a little summary or a margin note for a, a particular paragraph from our reading. And they were working with partners, they would uh, work out what their, their um, brief, you know, few word summary would be, and then they posted it. And I, I said, do, do not write the paragraph number, uh, because then this could turn into an activity where once we see uh, the different uh, margin notes or summaries of paragraphs, the partners could then take a look at those and say, okay, we see ours, now here are all these other ones, and we can match uh, the other students' margin notes to the different paragraphs. So uh, it's kind of a, a fun way to uh, bring in some interactivity um, through this platform. Okay, on the right, uh, you can see the word cloud, like we did earlier. And uh, this was in uh, a low-level topics class uh, or, and listening class. Um, I had homework for the students that they needed to, to find out what a durian is, be prepared to uh, tell me uh, in the next uh, class. And so uh, they came to class and I, I put up the question and they had to enter what, uh, or a description of a durian. And um, this was kind of a fun way to review their homework and to focus in on um, the ideas that uh, many of them were entering because with the word cloud, the larger words are the words that are entered multiple times. And so you can see that's where, uh, what more students are focusing in on. And I like to do the same thing with vocabulary reviews. Uh, if I have a, a word list or a, a terminology list and, and I ask them, you know, which words are you having trouble with? Sorry, up up a little higher? Yeah, question. So we had a question. Yeah, asking, great. Um, about the difference in those open-ended responses versus the, the word cloud responses. And if, and if you can signal to the students before they enter which type, if they're just supposed to enter a word or, um, or a sentence. OK. Um, I'm not sure, sure that it's visible to the student what type of um, display it's going to be. Uh, yeah, I, in fact, I'm, I don't think so. Uh, but you could, of course, tell them. It, and um, with the word clouds, 
uh, if, you're, if you want to do multiple words, you actually have to join them with underscores to have them come, come through as a phrase. Otherwise, it splits things up. But gotcha. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so, so yeah, I don't think there is a way to um, aut automatically have people know that it's a word cloud or, a, or the kind of wall, uh, wall of text. <laughs> All right. Uh, a few more examples of the, the kinds of um, responses and displays that we have in Poll EV. Uh, on the right, there's a ranking question. And again, from a reading class, this time I provided summaries or, or the margin notes for paragraphs. And they had to put um, these notes in order uh, out of five paragraphs. And on the right, we have the clickable image. And uh, here we had um, an image. There, there are a few default images that you can use from uh, Poll Everywhere. But uh, you can also upload any image uh, to use. And then you can uh, see uh, the yellow uh, points where uh, students have clicked. Right. Uh, by the way, uh, this is not actually where my students are, are from. Uh, <laughs> I, I cheated on this. Um, it, this was in a, a cross-cultural uh, exploration class. I have mostly international students, but a few American students. First, we did, where are you from? And then uh, this was a great you know, geography review as we said, OK, uh, what do we call this country? And again, practicing our English vocabulary. Uh, but then I said, OK, I'm going to clear the responses. And everyone click again and tell me, where would you like to visit? So this is actually the pinpoints are where, where they wanted to visit. And uh, I guess uh, a lot of people want to go to Australia and Canada. <clears throat> so, All right, uh, questions so far? Do we have any other questions at this point? OK, just a couple of other uh, things to show. And then I'll actually get into a demonstration of how I would set up these questions. Uh, so this is the, the competitions uh, style of question. It's basically a series of questions uh, tied together. And if you're familiar with Kahoot, um, it's, it's kind of a competitive thing where students can earn points for answering questions correctly, uh, more points if they answer questions uh, more quickly. And here are a couple of uh, examples uh, from a competition reviewing vocabulary or again, a, a low-level uh, topics class. All right. And finally, uh, I, I really like uh, using this so much that I use it not only for my classes, but for other areas of my professional interactions. Uh, so as a student ad, uh, association advisor, uh, I help them to select their officers with Poll Everywhere. And here, uh, I worked with my colleagues on uh, Raider training as we're, we're um, preparing to grade some placement essays and we want to synchronize our grading. Um, we've used this to, to help uh, aid in the discussion of which level should this essay be placed at. All right, so uh, as, as a summary of, of how I use Poll Everywhere, um, what I really like uh, how it encourages active participation. Students get to use their phones for something productive. And all of the students are responding, not just the ones who usually respond and that I tend to pay more attention to because they're, you know, they're the, the loud one, uh, active participants. So this gives everybody a chance to engage equally. Also, uh, it enables uh, anonymous feedback as well. Sometimes students are shy and they don't want to, to put their answers out there. And so this way it's in a, low risk uh, for them to share their answers. And uh, as, as I previously showed, there are lots of ways you can uh, integrate these kinds of questions into different class activities, which is uh, great for me as a you know, language skills instructor where we do lots of uh, interactive activities. If I were doing more lecturing, it might be a little more challenging to fit in, but there's still, I think, plenty of ways to do that as well. So some tips uh, that I would offer for effective integration. Uh, give a heads up uh, before you get started. Uh, it's one of the reasons I mentioned to you at, at the start, we will be using our devices. That way, um, it cuts down on the you know, surprise or the you know, fumbling around with your, your device time. Uh, also, uh, I usually, uh, I forgot in this case, but I usually tell um, participants to 
work with another person. If you have any kind of uh, connectivity issue, your, your battery looks like it might give out, um, be prepared uh, to join with someone or have someone join you. And uh, let's see, I, I think it's really great if you're doing kind of competitions, um, f features, that you give them a practice question or two so that they're not getting scored uh, while they're still trying to figure out how to answer the questions. And then start with the easier questions so that uh, they're getting uh, more comfortable with the response uh, format uh, as you go along. All right, so um, before you answer, let's go back here. <laughs> before you answer, I just wanted to demonstrate uh, from the Poll Everywhere website uh, how I would go ahead and create a question. So you'll start by going into Poll Everywhere. And you can see I've already logged in. Uh, of course, like, like most internet services, you'll need to create your account and then uh, you know, sign up for, for the uh, free account and log in. And once you do, you'll see a screen like this where you can check out your polls. And this blue button in the top left is how you get started with Create. OK, and here I have a variety of options for the different types of responses that I would like um, the students to ask. So let's say I wanted to do a word cloud question. I can click on the word cloud button, uh, put in the title, and then I click Create. And uh, then I have that poll ready to go. So is title where you put your question? OK, so the uh, question is, is title where you put the question. Um, Double check on that. <laughs> yes, it says title. Uh, we would put the question right there, right? Okay. Right. Another question? Yes. I got here a few minutes later, so I don't uh -huh. know how to enter the mobile. Um, okay. I'm consulting with the Iowa caucuses, so that's why I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but two questions. Is there a function you can do in this for attendance? Uh, well, uh, you, you could ask students to, to write their names, names and kind of like in the text text wall. Like I said, how but, are you today? Uh, dumps into right. Thing, so I uh, right with poll everywhere. Um, uh, I believe you can get some kind of integration into like a Canvas uh, system or or other um, you know classroom management system, but I've never uh, had the opportunity to play around with that. So. And the second. Uh, I'm a journalist, we always have one question that has two parts, right. um, even though they're separate. Um, I try to discourage my students from using their uh, mobile devices in class because of, uh, and I mean their phones, not they use laptops and whatever. Right. Uh, have you found that by using this that, yes, they're answering the questions, but they're also updating their Facebook status? No, but I'm texting. Okay. So, so the question is, uh, do we have issues with, with students staying focused and on task I mean, when they're using their phones, right? Uh -huh. I've got I have 45 students in a class, and are 35 of them that right. be. Right. Um, I, I, I typically tend to, to teach smaller classes, and so I, I don't have issues with that because uh, you know, I can stand right there and see what they're doing. Um, in, a, in a much larger class, a big lecture class, it might, it might be more of an issue. But again, that's not my teaching context. So. I can't speak to that. Good questions, though. Thanks. Yeah. Yes? So to relate to that, because I, I have the same experience, like a, one semester, one student's persistently really against me, and I have to just let him go to get out of my office. He, he was very mad, upset, because he was constantly using Facebook all day, and they didn't lie to me, but I knew that something like that. So I started you know, asking students, just don't use your devices, like your special phones. And, and your strategy, maybe I think, because like a lot honor system, maybe let them play, you make a statement before the semester starts, maybe it's too much, I don't know. Just, I'm very, I want to use this kind of technology in the classroom, but I'm also thinking about really destructive, you know, the, very, very few, but if once happens, it's right. not good at all. Right, I, I'm guessing that many of us have had similar issues yeah. with students who are just not able to uh, turn it off and put it away, and yeah. Um, I, I guess uh, it, it may vary from class to cl class to, to class and you know case to case. Yes. My father taught in the days before devices, uh -huh. and it was louder because they had a whole newspaper, 
And they made a lot of noise with that. <laughs> and so, I mean, I think we have to just keep in perspective that, mm. yes, students who want to be disengaged will be disengaged. Mm. And okay. I would rather have them texting than rattling a large format newspaper. Mm -hmm. Just what are any tips and suggestions? Really, one thing occurred to me, like maybe let them really kind of play as, you know, honor system because I respect mm -hmm. you, you know, and then, but I right. don't know. I've, I've been tempted to see what my, my PhD advisor, Donald mm -hmm. Shaw, said. Mm -hmm. He said, someone needs to be the night manager at, at uh, Holiday Inn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. I've, never, I've never had the nerve or the rudeness to yeah, say yeah, that, yeah. but I think very right. well. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I think we definitely have to set expectations about uh, uh, productive device usage. And in my syllabus, I actually have a statement saying I, I will allow devices and, and, and encourage use of devices, but it must be for class purposes. And yeah, and you have to, to be the policeman sometimes on that. But, okay. Um, uh, great uh, comments, thanks. So I, I need to uh, move, move along to give my colleagues time here. So, so uh, as you can see, this is the, the creation um, uh, page. And again, the, this is the, these are the basic types. I, I could do a clickable image, right? And then again, uh, the title could be the, uh, the question there that I would ask. Um, and there are uh, more options there as well, but um, these are the, the main functions here. I wanted to, to finish off this part about poll everywhere with one more poll for you. So now we'll go to that last page. You've already asked a few questions. I just want to see if you have any more and give you one more chance to, to practice uh, or experience the response. Oh, it's not live, so we need to click present here. <clears throat> okay, by the way, as you can see, I have the, the polls embedded into Google Slides. You can also embed them into uh, PowerPoint. Um, you, you may need to download an app or extension for your browser to get that to work um, well. But you can go right from your um, web browser and just use the, the, the browser interface there as well. So. so premium, how much is it for premium? Uh, again, it, I think it's per semester, it's uh, 13 or 14 per student, but like 350 for the, the professor. So uh, I'm not sure what the institution or department um, subscription levels are. Maybe uh, some of our uh, professionals over here have checked into that. I don't know. But, okay. <laughs> Another question. Uh, any suggestions for platforms that allow more than 40 responses. Um, Marta, are you going to mention a few of those? I will, yeah. I will yes, OK. So, so again, th there are several platforms that have a very similar, if not almost identical, um, functionality. And Marta will, will give you a few of those. OK. Uh, how many students in the free version? Uh, any number of students, but to, to, to get responses to a single question, uh, 40 is the cutoff. And if you have uh, more students than that in the class, I guess only the first 40 responses would register. Does this affect grades? Um, I have never used it uh, for grading. Um, I, I use it sometimes just for a quick comprehension check or you know, in my activi activities as I've shown. But uh, I, I have not used it for grading purposes. I'm sure uh, creatively you could think of a way to do that. And again, there, there may be uh, some content management systems or, or learning management systems that have uh, integration with that. I have never had students pay for this. Um, the largest classes I have ever taught had 30 students. So I've never reached the 40 student level. Is there research evidence on RTRS? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's some great research out there. I think a lot of the research uh, from the last couple of years is also looking back at studies on clicker devices. But for the newer um, kind of bring your own device uh, ones, I think we're, we're waiting for some, you know, some of the latest uh, research on those since they've only been around for four or five years, I think, or at least used widely for the last several years. Okay, and Marta spoke a little bit about some of that research. And uh, I think we'll have a, a link to our uh, PowerPoint where you can catch some of those links. Could 
quick question. Yes, have question. You had any of these, like Cahoots or, or Pull Everywhere or anything, allow you to submit verbal uh, wave uh, files? So, like, oh, okay. you get their verbal answer? Uh, Pull Everywhere does not, and I'm not familiar with any platforms that do. Um, as far as you know, being the, the real-time uh, response systems, but I am familiar with some uh, like Canvas platforms or extensions where you can get video comments. And, and th in fact, Tyra is going to talk a little bit about some like time-coded feedback, but I don't think that would really be in the kind of the real-time response uh, situation. So I, I don't think we have that yet. Uh, we can always you know just do the. Uh, Everyone, please share your answers if you would like and <laughs> hear what they're saying. But again, we have the issue of the shy students and you know the students who are more, more active dominating. OK, really quickly to finish up our questions here. And thanks for posting those, by the way. Um, so uh, is there research evidence? Yes. Uh, just need to practice. OK, yeah, yeah. I think uh, practicing with it and, and doing some simple questions uh, helps you feel more confident with it. OK. Uh, no questions? Great. And do you use this for quizzes? And if so, have you solicited feedback from students about the platform? Um, I have not used it for quizzes aside from informal uh, kind of competitions uh, type um, quizzing. Um, so anything that counts for a grade, uh, no. I've just used it for practice. Um, I have had the students give uh, feedback about the platform, and, and I've also used um, poll everywhere to give feedback about the class or about a particular um, uh, exercise or um, activity that we do in the class. So I have used it to, co to collect informal feedback. Yeah. And I've, I've only gotten good responses about poll everywhere. Uh, no one seems annoyed when I, when I say, OK, let's take out the phones again. So uh, that's positive. All right. Uh, and finally, have you had students use it to anomal Anonymously, publicly expressed dissent. Oh, I haven't, but that sounds very interesting. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, yeah. So if yeah. somebody put up something that was very inappropriate, do you have a way to remove that? Um, I have a way to clear all of the responses, and of course I can switch to a different screen or something like that, but I can't, uh, with the free version, you cannot moderate and delete a single response, unfortunately. But you can delete the whole thing. Yes, yes. Uh, or I can just hide, I hide the whole thing. Uh, so, right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'll turn the time over once again to Marta. Thank you, Kim. All right, yes. quick answer to the question, um, Robert? Mm -hmm. I remembered your name. So in the olden days of like 2007, I used to use VoiceThread. And it was free, so you could upload a, some sort of a prompt, and students could record videos, short snippets on it. I'm not sure if VoiceThread is still free. But VoiceThread. I found one that's called Flipgrid. Oh, Flipgrid, yeah. 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 That's right, Flipgrid is free. All right. um, okay, so um, the tool I'm going to be sharing with you today is uh, not a real-time response tool, but it does use elements of it. So uh, the tool I'm using, I've been using for over a decade is Quizlet, and it's a content study app or a tool that um, <coughs> students can use to prepare for uh, your classes for midterms, finals. Um, they can also use it to study for standardized tests like GRE, or in English we use TOEFL, which is um, a test of uh, English proficiency. Um, there's also I've, uh, th there's also other tests a student can study for, like different tests and standardized tests in nursing and so on. Uh, I've also found tests in like driver's tests and for different uh, um, states. Um, I am a language teacher, so I use it for language um, learning, uh, but it's not only uh, in English. It, uh, I'll show you, it has a lot of languages. I don't even know how many, uh, but hundreds. Um, 
uh, and um, it's very, very popular, and students really like it. So as soon as I introduce it in my classes, my students go crazy for it, and that's all they do. Uh, now, enough about students. It's about uh, instructors. This seminar is for instructors. So it's also very effective for instructors. Um, I use it to create study sets for my students. Uh, in my context, it's usually vocabulary, but not always, and I'll show you. Um, I also use it to help uh, students with um, material revision. Um, you can create different forms of assessment, whether diagnostic or um, um, informal and formal assessments. It's up to you. It's very, uh, I've used it both ways, and I'll show you how I do. Uh, you can also use it to monitor student progress. How much have they studied, how much they have masters, mastered. However, it's only in a pro version, okay? So, um, no, before we go there. Uh, so, let me show you a little bit what this is all about. Okay, so Quizlet, this is my dashboard. You have to create a, uh, an account and it will prompt you to create uh, a st well, student or teacher account. So you'll create teacher, it's free. Uh, and then you can create uh, sets of vocabulary, sets of term and meaning or uh, different study guides for your students. Um, then uh, you can um, create classes for your students and nest those sets in those classes. So you can see here on my dashboard on the left, let me make it a little bit bigger. Um, I have 37 classes and I sometimes reuse them, but um, you'll have, let's use, It's spring 2020. All right, this is one of my classes. So um, you create a class. This is this screen is a class, and all of these links you'll see here. This is different set in my in my in my class vocabulary. Okay, this is a class where I teach a students focus on speaking, and uh, over the years they've wanted to study. Students said they wanted to study idioms, which are very difficult to to study in isolation, usually you find them in context, but here I kind of went around it and decided, okay, I'm gonna group English uh, idioms uh, by themes. And you can see here, there's idioms to do with color, sports, body, and food. It doesn't mean that they are about food, it means that they use food vocabulary. So, um, so show us one more. I will, I will. Right. Uh, so, uh, for example, let's do sports idioms. Okay, this is what a set looks like. Oh, you know what, before we go there, I'm sorry. I'll go back. Because it's also important to have students in the classroom, okay? So once you create a class and add, populate it with different sets that you want students to study, study guides or vocabulary sets, uh, you have to have some members. And I already have some members in this class. But also, if I wanted to add somebody, I'll just copy that link, and then I can post it in Canvas for them or send it by email. And then they will click that link and uh, automatically become members of my class and have access to all of my sets. And it's free for them as well. They can also pay for pro account, but they don't have to. Um, my students have never paid. <laughs> I No, they, well, some have, but I've never told them to because they have full functionality for free. Um, so where were we? Okay, so. Let's take a look at a set. So basically a set looks like this. You have a term and a definition. So you see what I mean about sports idioms, like drop the ball, right? It, it's to make a mistake, right? So I've grouped them in, um, in, in kind of a group of uh, sports terms. And students now can see those, they can hear them, I don't know if that's going to Drop work. the ball. Oh, yeah. Make does. a mistake. Miss something. Not accomplish a task. And you can change the voice. Male, female, and different accents. Okay? Um, for you, as an instructor, it's super simple. So you just add a term, and then add a card, 
and I can add, I'm not going to think of a good idiom because I can't show you everything that I want to, but I'm going to think of a sports term. It's more, it could be a term or it could be a slang. So let's choose word player. And you see here I have it set English to English, but I can't, if I click on definition, it will tell me, oh, okay, it's someone who plays a sport or a game, software used to blah, 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 an actor. Now these that showed up have been created by other users. This is not like populated by Merriam-Webster or something. This is somebody has already created that term and it connects it to that definition. Okay, so you have to check it or you can type in your own. You can also go to image and it will show you different images of players. And it's like, hmm, I don't know if I'm thinking of this player. Again, it's been populated by other users. But, oh yeah, this could be a player. Okay, so I'm gonna add this as uh, one of the definitions. And then um, you could also change, because here I, use, I have my students uh, learn English to English, but you can change this to whatever language you want. As I mentioned, there are, I don't know how many. I mean, I keep scrolling, it's all languages. But if I wanted to do Polish, I'm from Poland, so maybe, oh, that's, yep and I click on the definition, it's going to give me Polish translation and I can choose the one. I'm like, oh yeah, Gracz is the one, so I'm gonna use this one. Of course, I'm not gonna do it right now, but um, you can use different languages. If you want the software to pronounce it nicely for you, like she did in English, there's only, not only, there's 18 languages that they do it for with perfect pronunciation. Okay, I haven't tested them, I don't speak all of them, but, um, I've, students say it, they claim it's all right. Okay, so I'm not going to actually do this. But now, I'm done. Okay, different ways that students can interact with it are here on the left. Um, flashcards, just like the good old index cards. On one side you have a term. You Drop click. the ball. There's a definition, okay. So these are cards. They can learn. This is more of like a long-term study where they will have be guided through a sequence of questions until they've answered each question twice correctly. And uh, they can actually set it to remind them to study it again. So there's repeat, uh, repeat um, uh, spaced repetition. So students will decide, I want to study it once a day, once a week. I want to study it once a month. And they can set that up for themselves. Then there's also uh, a way for them to see the definition and type up the term. There's also dictation where they will hear and they have to type. Have the upper hand. Have the upper hand, okay. They can also test themselves. Here they will have a mixture of different questions, either writing uh, typing out the answer or multiple choice questions. You can also change options. You can have match, true and false. You can choose to test all 15. And the students can do this on their machines, either laptop or um, smartphone. There's also a few games and uh, these are more um, how fast can you go? Here it's just a simple game of matching, like in the ballpark, approximately you just drag and drop and they disappear and you try to beat it as fast as possible. It creates a competition between all the students in your class. There's also gravity, which again, you see a definition. Come on. You see a definition and you have to write or you see a term and you have to write the definition. Uh, it's up to you, or decision, no, I missed it. Decision if I, use, yeah, it doesn't really matter because I'm really bad at this. Okay. So I can't type that fast. But if the second, this, these are meteors crashing into a planet. If you let the second meteor crash, you lose. So this is just how fast you can type. And if you remember the answer correctly. Okay, and the live game will actually practice in just a second, but that's the, that's the game that uses real-time response system. 
Okay. All right. So this is how students can learn and how they can interact. I've used all of these in class, just just having them projected and like maybe taking the test together, and this way students get a chance of responding or you know taking turns to respond to questions. But as a teacher, um, there's a few awesome things that I do just not to, not to have it so digital. So for example, um, I can print just study sets for students, just print it, and if they like their lists of vocabulary, they can study it that way, you know? But um, I actually use this in a little bit different way. I print cards like these, where one color is definition and one is a term. And then we have actually hands-on activities with games where um, I'll divide students into groups or pairs and then I have tons of vocabulary games that are all based on matching. So for example, um, students might, um, I might set, it, set, set those words out for them and they have to play type of a memory game. You know how kids play games where there's two pictures and they have, they're flipped two same pictures and they're flipped down and the students have to or actually kids just flip them out and try to find a match. And if they don't find a match, they flip them back and the next person goes and so on and so on. So this is one of the ways. We also do go fish with this. Um, we do, I've done headbands with students where they have to guess who they are or depending on what words we have. Um, but there's a lot of ways of integrating this digital technology into a classroom and making it tactile where they have to play with these words. Um, so that's one of the ways that I use it. And then, let's go back. And then when I told you about this um, assessment, ability to assess students, I use testing where students can test themselves at home, but then I use this test as a quiz uh, in class. So let's see, here um, there are 15 words in this set and I may go, to options and just choose. I just want them to do some written answers, some multiple choice, and I only want to quiz them on five. I create this test and they have three a right, right questions and two multiple choice questions. And then I just print this. And in my classes, it depends how many students I have, but if I don't have more than 10, which happens, each student could have a different quiz. So they could sit, sit all together and I just have printed 10 different quizzes. If you, you know, this could be a lot of paperwork if you have 100 or 200 students. So, um, however, Quizlet is, I think, the only um, of, I'm sure the only ones that we've talked about uh, today, a tool that is uh, fully integrated into Canvas. So I think most of them you can ask to integrate into your Canvas page, but this, this app actually shows in your Canvas, so you can uh, start using it. Um, okay. So um, I told you that we can also view student progress as they study, so kind of you know, you can, you can spy on your students. And um, let's see. That's not what I wanted to do. Okay, we'll go to my class. Okay. And by each of the sets, on the right, you'll see those little bars. This is the progress report. So my students this semester have studied this. Let's see how well they studied. So you can choose a class, because I've, I've used it with multiple classes. So let's see, maybe with last year, we'll see. And then you set the time when you want to spy on your students. Look at that. A year ago, nobody studied this. Well, maybe that's too late. Let's see, maybe, uh, let's do this year, because my students had just taken a quiz on this today. That's last year. Past year. No, no, no. That's not the students, 2020. All right, it's a tiny class. I have four students in there, okay? Okay, and I see one pl person played match six hours ago. All right, just before his quiz. This person learned and this person took a test. And you can see, best try 100%. So you can see how well they do, but you have to pay for this. To do this, you have to pay. And um, I think it comes out to about three bucks a month, and it's 30 something a year, okay? 
uh, if you want to actually get this. So, let's go back to the set and let me show you how this RTR works, that response system. So here I'm going to ask you to pull out a, 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 your device if you want to, because if you commit to playing this game, you have to move and find your partner, okay? So if you want to do it, it's great. I need four people. People who broadcast will not be able to do this. I mean, they would be able to, but it will be difficult to coordinate. So um, it's probably the only option for people who are here. So if you guys are interested, let's play a game and see how well you know American idioms. Related to sports. Okay, turn off music because this is off. Okay, two ways to, to join. You can either scan the code or you can go to quizlet.live and type in the code. <laughs> it's so convenient. Okay, I'm going to wait a few seconds to see if anybody else wants to join us. Anybody else is still working? And if you haven't joined, you're welcome to join one of the groups, okay? All right, numbers are not changing. Oh, they are, I'm sorry. Anybody else? Am I waiting for anybody else? No? Okay. So let's get going. I'm going to assign random teams, okay, and I'll tell you where they are. Oh my goodness, it stayed in Polish. <laughs> the first word is unicorns. So would unicorns please come here? Somewhere here, unicorns, the first one. Jocelyn, Robert, and Baron. Baron? Alpacas, if you can guess, alpacas. Where would alpacas want to be? They're down Main Street, they have a whole bunch of them. Really? Yeah, you get wool, wool alpaca. Oh, okay. okay. That's a joke. Oh, so where, what's your group? Ryan. Ryan, Ryan. Alpac okay, alpacas are going to meet here. There you go. Koalas, koala, travesty, that's Travis. Okay, we'll come join you, Travis. And then, and then Rekina, that's sharks, who are sharks. Sharks will converge right here, okay? Jednorożce, I'm sorry, jednorożce. Okay, and I'll join you guys in just a second. Has everybody found their group? Are the groups sitting together? Yes. Okay. So let me give you a quick rundown. As soon as I hit start the game, on the screen you'll see each group's progress. In your group, you will, everybody will see the same question, which is going to be the definition, and each of you have, will have a, f uh, a few options, multiple choice, okay? But each of you in a group has different multiple choices, so you have to figure out who has the right answer, and you can talk. I mean, I've done it to my students where they can't talk, <laughs> but talking is better, okay? So let's just try and just see how that goes. I usually do a tri trial run for them to figure it out, and they do. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna start the game and run to my group. You get, you get the feel for this, you know, it's, it's, it's competitive, it's fun, students love it. You can't overuse it. I mean, you can overuse it. There is such a thing as you, overuse of this. They get bored after a while, you know? Like, in the beginning of a semester, it's like, teacher, can we play live game? And then, like, let's not play live game anymore. I'm like, okay, do you guys want a Kahoot? Yeah, 
and they want to <laughs> they want to switch. And um, then you know I get inventive. This works really well with shorter definitions when you do teach um, languages or if you have something that's not too much to put on the screen. Um, I've never used it with long definitions and concepts, but uh, Quizlet per se is not just for language. I've I've done a lot of um, exploring, and I can exit game, and you can browse different of uh, different uh, fields depending on your field. I mean, I've never thought about using it for math, but if you click here, you can have sets on calculus. And I'm not going to embarrass myself and go in and show you how little I know, but look at this. You can have a graph, and then you can have particular points, just like uh, in Paul EV, you know, where you could, you could have visuals. You can make these uh, posters for students where they can start, uh, study different uh, uh, terminology, but also it still has the set for you where you can put in different things. I don't understand any of this. I shouldn't say that, should I? But, um, it's not your job. <laughs> but I should. I took calc. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's, there's science, there's, uh, there was a dance one. You can learn about choreography. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can actually go find a set that's already been created and then reuse it. Um, you know, for example, if you're uh, a Spanish a Spanish teacher and uh, you want you're looking for something really simple, um, you know, this is all has been done for you, and you can just go and oh, we're gonna learn animals in Spanish. You can go into that set and hold on. Oh, where's copy? This this one not customizable. Uh. We can, you can, you can, you can export it. So I could add it to my class, uh, but most of them are just so easy as like you can just copy it and then make it your own and add it to your class. But somebody's done this. They have a nice visual here, and then um, set for each of the words, for each of the animals. So um, you can make it fit your class. Uh, I mean, it took, I mean, I've been using this for a very long time, but I learned by just playing with this and copying from people and learning uh, more. But pretty much, this is Quizlet, and um, it uses real-time response system in a fun way, as you saw. Otherwise, it's just uh, a great way for students to learn and um, for teachers to to take a little bit of shortcuts when it comes to printing things. Um, now. Let's see here, go back to our presentation. Um, before I move on, uh, Kim, Kim promised you that I will tell you something, so I wanted to tell you before we uh, go on. Um, we've compiled a handout uh, in, on which you will find all different options, all of the uh, tools that we talked about today, but also other uh, op uh, options for uh, real-time response systems. You've asked about free versions or things that are free. It's on the uh, and handout, and we'll tell you about it a little bit later. So now Tyra is going to tell you a little bit about a feedback system, go react. For time's sake, thanks, just there is fine, yeah. So as teachers, I know that feedback is something that we give our students all the time, whether it's written, if we uh, create rubrics for our classes. I'm a huge fan of rubrics. I love using them. I give them to my students before an assignment is due so they know exactly what to expect, what I expect from them, how they'll be graded, what their criteria will be like, how many points they'll get for every um, criteria. Observation forms, questions, and uh, comments under the assignment. If we go on Canvas, these are different things that we can do. We also give oral feedback as well, and that can be also done on Canvas under the assignment or if you meet face-to-face. -face. So these are the common forms that we give our students feedback, right? Did I miss any of them? No? Okay. 
So Go React is a tool that is actually available for all of us on Canvas. And I'm going to take us through step by step how to create one and then what can be done inside of it. The reason I started using Go React is because I teach a speak, speaking class very frequently. It's called Academic Discourse, where we teach students how to give different kinds of speeches in an American classroom setting. Um, and for a lot of them, it's the first time that they've ever had to present in a class. So we go through different skills. So we go through this, um, how to prepare for a presentation. And then once they are presenting, different things like pronunciation, um, wait time, filler words, different aspects of presenting a speech. So on Go React, they can upload their recordings or they can record it as they are presenting. And I as a teacher or they, for them as students as well and when they're doing peer reviews, they can go in and watch their videos and as they're watching, they can give uh, time-coded feedback for each other and I'm going to show you different ways to do that. So they can upload their recordings from their cell phone, from their laptop or a regular camera. We can also embed stream uh, videos into the system. So there are two screens all the time. So if the student is watching a video that I embedded, I can watch them as they watch the video because maybe I want them to translate it or maybe I want them to react to what they're watching. Um, so you can do that also on Go React. And the feedback that you give, it can be via text as I type in, or I can record myself with the video giving feedback as I'm watching their presentation and also just audio. If I don't want them to see me, but I want them to be able to listen to my voice and what I'm saying. And it can be done live in the moment while the recording is going on. So if I was a student and someone there was the teacher watching my recording, I can be back there typing a response and feedback as they're presenting and it's still being recorded. Or I can just have them, for example, for my class, I let them go to the library to practice in groups and I have them record each other on their cell phone, then upload it to the assignment and later on in the day when all submissions have been uploaded, I can go in at home or in my office and give the feedback that I want. Yes? So I used to try to use Go React and because my students need to do like 20 minute, 30 minute lessons, mm -hmm. what I found was that it wouldn't ever load into Canvas. Has that gotten better? My videos, the longest I believe that I had one was 10 minutes, but I do know because I learned about this from some teachers in special education mm -hmm. and they did use it. I just saw it last August mm -hmm. and they said that that issue had been worked out and that they had been able to get those longer videos to upload. I thought they were using it outside of the Canvas space, but if it was... Anyway, I'll ask, I'll ask Techie. Okay. So there are three types of time-coded feedback that you can give. Okay, this first one is called a marker set. So this looks like a rubric um, and it's all color-coded and you design them. So every one of these little things means something to me. I'd have to click over it to remember what they are, but I can guess that some of them are speed, how fast they're speaking, filler words, wait time, um, pronunciation errors, missing introduction. You, anything that you want them to pay attention to, you can create a marker set. So as you're watching the video, you click on the one that you want them to pay attention to, either something that they did well, something that they need work on. And it's time coded. So as I'm watching, I click on the marker and it gives me a few seconds to stop the video and make sure I have it where I want it and it keeps going. And anytime I give some kind of feedback, whether it's with the marker, whether it's with video or audio, or whether I'm typing in the feedback, the video that I'm watching stops so that I can finish my thought and then it continues. So I don't miss anything while I'm doing it. And the audio, like I said, it's that little camera where 
my camera on my computer would turn on, and as I'm watching theirs, I can be saying things, and again, it stops, lets me finish my thought, my sentence. Once I press done or enter, it continues. And same thing with audio. And this is an example of what it looks like when I type something in. So I have the student's presentation on one side, and then I have my comments on the other, and it t tells you exactly where in the video they, I have this comment for them. And this was especially helpful for my students because um, I used to give them the rubrics, but if in the rubric I said, oh, you mispronounced some words, and if, even sometimes if I said what the word was, they might have said the word multiple times. So which time was it that they pronounced it incorrectly? Which time was it where they should have stressed this word instead of that word to um, let us know what the important key words were? So with the time-coded feedback, as you can see over here, as they're watching it, as students, my comments pop up on their screen so they can see exactly where it was that they made that mistake or that they did something well. I don't just focus on what they did wrong. But, um, so this is what the screen looks like. And then I'm going to try and quickly give you a few examples. So we're gonna go with a sample video that I already have from a student um, that has feedback that I gave and then a presentation where I'm going to give feedback and then starting an assignment from scratch, okay? So this was the one that already had and this moves around. So this student submitted this video and I provided the comment for it. And as I show you how to make an assignment undergo React, you'll see that you can also have rubrics. So I don't completely walk away from the rubrics because after they submit their video, I have them grade themselves so that they can see the things that they need to work on. So this one's mine, but then here's how they graded themselves. So they see the same screen where they watch their presentation and the rubrics here, and then they can click on the grade they want to give themselves, depending on how well they did and then my comments are here, okay? So we'll see what it looks like. Hello, good morning, my name is David. Um, today I'm gonna to be talking about the process of making cheese. So the process of making cheese, there are six steps to it. Um, can be less, can be more, depends on how you explain it. So what, I'm, so what I'm going to be starting off with is um, one of the first steps, but before I get to that, uh, do you ever think about when you um, drive by Domino's? Uh, so if I'm David and I want to see what my teacher wrote me, I can just pause it and then read it and then I can keep going. And then I'll show you as a teacher how the video stops. Of, where that cheese comes from on that really good pepperoni pizza. Um, How is it made? Okay. This is a presentation, again from David, that now I would start watching and then I would add a comment to. For these presentations, I commented more than I did the marker set because I found that for them, writing my comments was a little more helpful than the marker set. Uh, because it does go by quickly, but I'll still show you how to use them because they're still good to have. So, I would start watching it. Um, good morning. My, my name is David Hernandez. Um, cardiac insufficiency. What, it, what is cardiac insufficiency? So here I want to tell them to remember to start with an intro. because that was part of the assignment, not to just say right away what the word was. So I'm done. Um, it is mostly known as heart failure. Um, it is when the heart muscle pumps function is reduced. Uh, this leads to the heart being unable to pump the power that is needed to go throughout the body. Uh, 
this is uh, yeah, some characteristics about diastolic and systolic. Some of the, I, I'm gonna name the differences of Okay, so you get these the gist. These two characteristics that come with... That's a tough topic. Yeah, they were supposed to define a word. And he chose cardiovascular, I don't know what, it's not even his major, but he really wanted to go for it, so I let him. <laughs> so, but he was trying. And uh, so that's how the comments work, okay? And you can set this up any way you want, and I'll show you now how to set it up. So I'm also starting to use this in my Spanish class. Um, so you would just go under Assignments. I'll bring it here. I'll add a new one and start off with more options. Sample. I can write the instructions here. Assign the points just like we normally do on our Canvas classes. Okay. And then under submission is where you'll find the tool. So you go submission, external tool, find, BCD. Oop. there it is. Go react, select. And if you click on this, load it in a new tab, it's just when the assignment opens, you click on it and it'll open in a new tab. I like to see it all in one, so I rarely click on it. And then I'll save it. And there's my assignment. Okay, so you have to, if you've done an assignment like this before, you can click on the course that you've used it at in and then click the assignment itself. We're starting brand new, so I'm going to start here. So there are three types of uh, assignments that you create with these. The standard one is where they upload the images, the videos that they record on their devices. This one, the stimulus, um, they're watching something I've uploaded for them. They don't upload it, I upload it, like a video from YouTube or Kaltura or something like that. Okay, can they comment on that one? They can comment on it as well. On all of them, they can comment. It just... Um, In writing or... Yes, written or orally. And then comment only, I use this one for when they are doing a peer assessment on someone else. I can create groups where they can watch each other's videos and then write in or speak into the comments as well. So I'll just do standard. And when this... Did you say orally as well? Yes. Okay, so that was his question. Yes, orally. Um, when you first log on to this, it'll just ask you to plug in your Utah State email for your students and for you as a teacher. So I'll go next. And then this is standard, like I said. And then private, it, you can't watch it outside of Canvas. And I know I'm out of time, so I'm just going to hit private, points, multiple cameras, sure. Here's my marker set, OK? If you want a new one, add a marker. What do I want to judge them on? Body language. Use of verbs and preterite. Let's say pronunciation, uh, speed. What else? Grammar. OK, you can make it anything you want. And then you can click OK. So that will pop up on your video. If I want the students to have a rubric, then I would create one here as well. I have one here, so I'm just going to show you what it looks like. You create it just by dragging things from here down to here. And then you can make it a number scale, qualitative, or a point system. Okay. And then the instructions I want them. Tell me about your weekend. And of course, this is going to be in Spanish. You can make it as detailed as possible. Or if you want to record yourself, then you can. Giving the instructions and then done. 
Okay, so then as the students post their assignments, that's what you'll see. Let me go back here. So this is what it looks like. I have all my students there. Haven't graded any, but if I want to go in, So because I did the marker set on this one, that would also pop up on this screen and I would hit marker set and then I can just click as she goes along. Okay. And I'm out of time. Right, and thank you so much for coming. If you have any further questions, please email any of us. We can share the slides with you, but also we've created the handout that I mentioned. If you scan this QR code, it will take you straight to Google Doc with our handout, and you'll find tons of other awesome sources. Thank you again.